it, uh, should write it in the Q&A box. And it would be better if they, uh, before the question, write to which uh, speaker uh, the question is addressed. So with this, uh, 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 Luca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matteo. I hope you can see you well. Um, so um, I'm very happy to participate in this uh, mass conference. So your voice is a little bit uh, low. Can you speak closer to the microphone? Can you hear me better? Or is it still low? A little bit, yes. OK. Can I try and work on it? Uh, it's kind of the maximum. Okay. Can you, you still hear me very low? I'll oh, try with a little bit better. Uh, go ahead. I'll try without the headphones, maybe. Huh? Sorry? I'll try without the, the headphones. I'll try that way. Oh, I, I think it's OK. Can, can you hear me better now? Yes, a little bit, yes. OK, sorry about this. OK, today I'm very happy to talk about uh, some work done in collaboration with uh, very bright student who just got his master from uh, ENS, Hugo Kui and uh, Lenka Steborova. And uh, in this talk, I will be talking about uh, active learning. And so first I will give a brief, brief introduction to the field. And then I will talk about the theoretical framework we employed to derive some uh, uh, theoretical performance bound for active learning in this uh, simple model. And we did this through a large deviation analysis uh, based on our replica calculation. And uh, finally, we'll briefly talk about also about the algorithmic side of the problem, where I will show that AMP can be used um, to almost saturate these uh, theoretical bounds we derived in the analysis. So active learning is a field of machine learning that deals with problems where you have a lot of data, but obtaining the labels for this data may be very expensive. And uh, a very important example is text classification. As you know, uh, internet provides basically an infinite source of text, but if you want to know what's the topic inside of one of these uh, pieces, then basically you need a human to annotate, to, uh, to say what, what the topic was. And this is a, an expensive process. So it is uh, very important to uh, have some strategies to select which of these uh, uh, input data should be labeled in order to extract the best information possible and in order to train a model that uh, gets to the best uh, possible generalization. And um, specifically, pool-based active learning is a case where you have a fixed set of uh, examples, which is our pool, and from these you can choose um, a certain subset of example to be labeled, and uh, this, the size of this uh, subset is your budget. So you're given a certain budget and you will try to do your best choice in order to get to the best generalization. And uh, what this amounts to is to have some type of cycle, uh, this uh, pool-based active learning cycle, where you have your machine learning model and you have the unlabeled data pool. And then uh, what you do is to train model on uh, on whatever you had before and then test it on the unlabeled data and uh, you see where the model is more confident and where the model is the least confident you will try uh, to uh, get the, the labels in order to extract more information and then you retrain your model and you keep repeating this cycle so instead of having a complexity a computational complexity of order and squared as a usual training algorithm here you have to cycle through many times, an extensive number of times, so the computational order is at least n cubed. So of course we wanted to do some uh, theoretical analysis and you have to uh, pick a very, very simple model in order to get through the computation. And so uh, we go back to our uh, favorite uh, teacher-student perceptual model. Uh, that is one of the simplest models where you can define a notion of uh, generalization. In this model, uh, you first extract um, a teacher uh, vector, and then you extract a matrix, both from IID Gaussian priors. And then uh, you use the teacher to uh, obtain the ground truth tables for these uh, patterns by taking the scalar product between a teacher and the patterns and taking the sign of this. And this is your training set. So what you want to do is to find a student perceptron, which is another vector, uh, which is able to give the same classification on the training set. 
and then you want to see uh, whether it is also able to give the same prediction on previously unseen examples. And uh, what we added to this framework is that now the student also has a budget. So instead of seeing the entire pool of uh, examples, you will be able to select just a fraction of it. And, and this n is, of course, uh, smaller than alpha, which is the entire uh, the, the, uh, proportionality constant between uh, the input dimension and our data set uh, size. And note that even though we are selecting the very simple case of IID uh, uh, normal patterns, uh, when you select uh, with an active learning uh, rule your uh, subset of patterns, then correlations can appear in the subset. So it's not that trivial. What is the uh, most important ingredient for making us uh, able to do the, the calculation is that in this uh, very specific model, uh, there is a, a direct relationship between the, um, the mutual information between the teacher and the labels and another quantity that we all know, which is the Gardner volume. And the Gardner volume is nothing but uh, the uh, volume of the, uh, or the entropy of a hypothesis for the student that uh, give the same predictions on uh, the training set. So uh, if you have a smaller volume, it means that you have uh, 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 less uncertainty about the teacher, and so you will generalize better. So uh, what our trick was is that instead of studying the large deviation of position error, which is not trivial to do directly, we could study the large deviation of the Gardner volume. And so what we did is to introduce a, a set of uh, selection variables which take values uh, 0 or 1, whether you choose or not the, the pattern uh, to be put in the training set. And then uh, its uh, uh, probability measure is based on um, the introduction of an e energy controlled by the uh, inverse temperature beta, uh, and the energy is the Gardner volume. And then you also have a chemical potential phi, uh, which set, sets the budget of, uh, for your student. And what you can do is that in the high dimensional limit, uh, everything should be uh, self-averaging and uh, you should be able to uh, just study uh, the free entropy that you get uh, in the typical case. And this can be split into three contributions. You have the contribution from the Garner volume, the contribution um, from the uh, budget, and finally you have a contribution that gives you the complexity, so uh, the log number of possible choices of subsets that gives you that same volume. So what we really want to do is to see how many possible choices uh, get, get you to some uh, better uh, generalization than random. And uh, uh, the catch is also that this entire calculation is not saying anything about uh, to choose the labeled subset. You, we're just saying, in general, what is the best possible uh, um, performance that you can achieve in this setting. And so when you do the replica calculation, uh, even though we did it in our replica symmetric assumption, since it is basically a two-level problem, the, repli the replica calculation really looks like a one RSP calculation. You have two overlaps between students, and the first one will be uh, between students with the same uh, choice of labeled subset, and the other one will be with different choices. And then, of course, we will have a norm for the students and a typical magnetization, which is the important parameter uh, for the generalization. It gives you the overlap between the, the teacher and the student. And the expression you get in the end really, really looks like the 1RSP expression uh, for the perceptron. Uh, apart from the fact that in uh, the energetic term, we have a trace over the selection variable. And what we get is uh, this type of uh, phase diagram. So there are a lot of curves in this diagram, but uh, in general, we will focus just on one. So here the uh, pool size was alpha equals three. And we can look, for example, at the red curve where the budget is 0 0.3, so it's one tenth of the full data set. And what we have is that when beta is equal to zero, so we are looking at the typical case, we're not studying any large deviation, we get the, the description of uh, uh, the case where you're taking a random subset of the patterns, and this is just the typical Gardner volume for that size. And uh, the complexity of choices, so the, the number of possible subsets that gives you this volume is nothing but the binomial distribution. However, when you turn on uh, beta, uh, both positive or negative, you can study atypical cases. So what we really care is the beta negative case, where the uh, volume will be smaller 
than the one you would get from random choice, so that you are uh, doing better uh, generalization than uh, than in the random case. And uh, however, from the computational point of view, finding these atypical uh, subset is a very hard problem. I also note that on the left of the plot, we have a vertical axis that shows the uh, volume that you would get from learning the entire pool of uh, data set, uh, of patterns, sorry. And uh, what you see is that uh, while that uh, vertical line uh, uh, works for alpha equal three, even if you take a budget 0.9, you can get very close to this volume, meaning that the entire information that was contained in the data set is actually contained in a much smaller fraction of the data set. And what we also saw is that, of course, when you get um, to uh, smaller volumes, the magnetization increases, meaning that uh, you get uh, more aligned with the teacher, so the generalization gets lower. Another way of looking at this large deviation is to look on how fast you approach or you saturate the maximum uh, amount of information contained in the entire data pool. And what we show in this plot is that, uh, for example, for different colors, mean, uh, we have different pool uh, sizes, and uh, we see that basically the number of patterns you need to pick from these pools um, is logarithm, logarithm, logarithmic in the entire size of the pool uh, if you want to start basically almost the entire information. And um, so basically the decrease in the volume uh, becomes exponential, which is not the typical case, which in, in this plot is the uh, purple curve. Um, however, we have to go back to a detail which I mentioned, that is the fact that uh, our uh, theoretical bounds apply for any active learning algorithm, and this means also for algorithms that were uh, informed on the generative, generative process and uh, were able to exploit some external information, which is not really the case that we uh, usually consider. Uh, in the case where you have no prior information about the generative process, the most information you can get from any every pattern is, of course, one bit uh, of information because that's the sign of the pattern you're actually querying. And uh, this is represented by the volume healthing curve, which is the dotted uh, black line in this plot. Still, if you even uh, stick to this curve, you're extracting the information with a logarithmic number of patterns with respect to the entire pool of patterns. So in this case where you have no information on the structure of the patterns, talk about algorithmic strategies that are usually employed uh, to, to do active learning. And the most uh, common one is called uncertainty sampling. And it's very simple. Basically what you do is you keep updating your learning model. And when you have to choose uh, more patterns to be labeled, what you do is that you test your model on the unlabeled patterns and look where um, the, the model is currently least confident. And then you label these patterns. So you go through this cycle where you train your model, evaluate model predictions, you sort according to its confidence, and then you query the labels of the most uncertain samples until you uh, have used in your, your entire budget. budget. So what, what we did was to uh, make a comparison between uh, uh, some uh, known uh, algorithmic strategies uh, and uh, an algorithmic strategy that we adapted for this specific case, which is based on uh, message passing. And uh, of course, we are a bit uh, um, I mean, it's not that uh, impressive that we're doing so well because we are in a model where we know that AMP is uh, uh, estimating uh, posterior means and variances almost perfectly. Um, however, uh, we can see in this uh, plot that, uh, for example, the yellow points representing the, the performance of AMP almost stick perfectly to the uh, volume health curve represented by the uh, dotted curve, while all the other algorithm algorithms uh, kind of fail um, to do uh, as well. And uh, an example where it is pretty famous is, for example, a query by committee, which is a famous paper on this uh, subject. And uh, the fact that uh, we are doing better is just because uh, query by committee is trying to sample the posterior by actually learning uh, various models and trying to making them uh, uh, independent. Well, we are able to do that with message passing uh, so efficiently. I'll skip this because I have no time. And I'll go to the end. So um, in the end, uh, we have this analysis and we have uh, also some limits from this analysis. The first one is that uh, we did the stability analysis for uh, replica symmetric ansatz. 
and uh, uh, we see we saw that uh, indeed uh, one RSP uh, would be needed to describe the most extreme cases, and uh, the, the RS results are only stable around the, the beta equals zero uh, case. However, we saw from the algorithm results that uh, uh, things uh, seem to behave quite uh, close to, to what we got from our theoretical calculation, so we don't expect the 1RSP correction to be very large. Uh, another important point is that we had to use this trick of studying large deviation of the garden volume instead of the uh, generalization error directly, and this is not uh, doable in many other models, so it would be nice to have a more general uh, approach. And another interesting point is that, as I said, when you take a subset of uh, IID patterns, uh, they're no longer IID. And so uh, AMP is, not, is no longer guaranteed uh, to converge. And this is interesting because if you look at it from a satisfaction, uh, con uh, constraint satisfaction problem point of view, then you, you, basically you have that uh, uh, AMP makes, um, it's harder for AMP to converge when you have less constraints than more constraints. And uh, finally, we are looking into trying to connect this framework with uh, label weighting strategies, for example, soft labeling and uh, distillation, which all try to get the best possible generalization out of this process. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I look forward to your questions.